Hi everyone, welcome back to Extra Credit, and today is our seventh episode on the history of ancient Rome. Last time we saw how the Roman Republic was pretty much ready to fall apart by the beginning of the first century BC after a whole bunch of crises had kind of overwhelmed the Roman state. And if you've been paying attention so far, you've noticed that at the end of pretty much every episode, I have made some sort of dire, ominous comment foreshadowing the imminent doom of the Roman Republic. And then I said last time that today we would finally see how this all comes crashing down. But that's actually not true because today we're not going to see it all come crashing down. It's going to take like three more episodes, but we are going to meet the person today who is probably most responsible for it coming crashing down, so close enough. So last time we saw how these two Roman generals, Marius and Sulla, had caused shockwaves throughout their empire by launching this firestorm of killing, where each side was trying to kill off the supporters of the other side, and it ended with Sulla coming out on top as the dictator and hunting down his political enemies. One of these young men who had to run for his life or else risk being killed by Sulla was a young nobleman by the name of Gaius Julius Caesar. He actually claimed to be descended from the Trojan Aeneas, whom we met in our first episode, who was actually a mythical character. And Caesar's family claimed to be descended from him, making Caesar sort of divine because he was descended from one of the gods, or in this case, the goddess Aphrodite. Now, mythology aside, you've probably at least all heard the name Julius Caesar before, and even if you haven't, you've probably at least eaten the delicious salad named after him. And not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but the reason why Caesar is going to be such a big deal is because he really does end up causing the downfall of this whole political system called the Republic. But as we're going to see, it wasn't his fault alone. It was a whole bunch of different factors over time that we've already seen, namely the rise of these prominent, powerful men who tried to take more and more power for themselves. And Caesar is simply the last in this long series of dictators, or you could call him the first, because he becomes the first unofficial emperor of Rome when it transitions from being a republic into an empire. So to begin with, Caesar grew up in this really unstable time around Sulla's dictatorship in which people were losing their lives, and Caesar fled from Rome where he gained military experience out east in the Mediterranean and learned how to become a really good public speaker. This was because he wanted to launch a public career in Rome, and he was aiming at as much power as he could possibly get, which was the sort of common goal of many young Roman noblemen. The difference was that Caesar was prepared to do whatever it took to gain the consulship, meaning the top job in the Roman Republic. As we saw several episodes ago, there were always two consuls, so they could share power between themselves. Spoiler alert, Julius Caesar's not going to be very good at sharing. He didn't go to kindergarten, I guess. But by the time 61 BC has rolled around, Julius Caesar has already held various offices in the Roman Republic, and he's now serving a pretty sweet gig as the military governor of the province of Spain. During his time there, he makes an even more famous name for himself by conquering and subduing some of the local tribes in that area. And according to one legend, which may or may not actually be true, he was apparently riding through a tiny Spanish village and said, I would rather be first man in this village than second man in Rome, which is a pretty key insight into his mentality. When Caesar got back to Rome, though, now he wanted to become consul once and for all and seal the deal as the top person in the land. However, to do this, he would need a lot of cash. The reason is because it was very common for Roman politicians to actually bribe people to vote for them. They would kind of slip people money on the sly. The difference was that Caesar did this in broad daylight. He didn't even try to hide the fact that he was bribing people to vote for him, although he was also helped a lot by the fact that people did genuinely like him and admire him for all his great accomplishments. However, Caesar was somewhat short of cash, and so he went knocking at the door of a very wealthy and famous Roman named Pompey. 
Pompey is going to become a really big deal as well because he at this time was probably the most famous general in the Republic. He had conquered lots of lands out east, such as the province of Judea, for example, and Caesar wanted to become pals with him so that they could help each other out. Pompey had a bunch of political things he wanted somebody to do for him, so Caesar could do that, and Caesar needed somebody to pay his way to office, and Pompey could do that for Caesar. So it was a bit of an I scratch your back, you scratch mine type of situation. Just hoping that the scratching doesn't turn into knifing later on. So with Pompey's help, Caesar does end up becoming elected consul in the year 59 BC. His colleague Bibulus is so weak and ineffective that instead of saying that this was the year when both Caesar and Bibulus were consuls, everybody says this was the year when both Julius and Caesar were consuls, which was a very funny joke back then. However, what's not so funny is that Caesar has now made himself tons of political enemies, especially in the Senate. You see, the old senators want to guard the way that things have always been done, and this means eliminating bribery and corruption. When they look at Caesar, they see someone who is prepared to do whatever it takes to seize pun intended, all the power that he can. And all the bribery that Caesar had committed and all the illegal things he had done to gain office really ticked off these old senators. And so many of them wanted to see Caesar cast out of Rome or possibly even dead. This was a problem for Caesar because although while he is consul, he can't be prosecuted for any crimes because you are immune to that when you're in office, as soon as Caesar has done his time in office, he is open to being prosecuted by all of his enemies and taken to court, which will certainly end in his either exile or death, both of which are obviously undesirable. And so what Caesar and Pompey do is they work together and they land Caesar a really, really awesome job as the governor of southern Gaul. This was a province to the north of Italy, which Caesar will actually go on to expand greatly. But the whole point of this is that as long as Caesar holds political office of some kind, including being governor in Gaul, nobody can prosecute him. Again, he's untouchable. And so after his time as consul is done, Caesar heads north and becomes the governor of southern Gaul, and he is initially supposed to be there for five years, which was already a vastly extended time period. Most consuls only got a one-year job as governor when they were done, but Caesar gets himself five years. This will actually become closer to 10 years by the time it's all said and done, and during that whole time, as we're gonna see next time, Caesar is immune from political prosecution, and he can do pretty much whatever he wants. However, as Katniss Everdeen could tell you, sooner or later, you gotta come back and face the other tributes. And they're not gonna be very happy with you. And that is what we are gonna see next time on Extra Credit. See you later. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. It's always a good time making this show. Hopefully you are enjoying it. Sorry for such a long wait between episodes six and seven. Uh, I'm hoping the next couple are a little bit quicker as well. Your challenge for this week is to figure out what were some other political offices that Caesar held before he became consul. And we will see you next time.